you start out, I'll let you guys introduce yourself again. The crowd, the crowd's changing. Sponsored by Honeywell, and we got two folks coming in up from Phoenix, and they're driving as fast as they can. I think they're going to sneak in about a few minutes into the presentation. So I'm Mike Fabian. Uh, this is the third uh, propulsion, ME propulsion briefing. This is this is sponsored by Honeywell. It's all the panel members introduce themselves, and then we'll let the team take it away. Hi, my name is Ron Floyd. I'm a senior consulting engineer, for the technology and innovation Bureau for Arizona Public Service. <laughs> uh, I'm Jacob Older. I'm with Nader through the China Lake Group. I'm Josh Johnson. I'm the ADI's test lead on K-46 in the Air Force. And I'm Gary Costantino. I'm a senior flight operations engineer at NASA. <coughs> Here's an image of Iris's original test configuration. As you can see on the right, we have the 
uh, blower, which provides the air mass into Iris. Just behind Iris here, we have a variable frequency drive, which powers and regulates the electric motor seen at the bottom left here. This electric motor is uh, connected to Iris via a drive bell, which helps Iris spin at high speeds. I'll now go over the design parameters of the lines. We found it a challenge to meet all uh, parameters to 100% accuracy, and working with Honeywell established an acceptable deviation of 5%. We have here a chart of some of the uh, critical uh, physical dimensions on IRIS and uh, that directly relate to the non-dimensional parameters that we will be using. We have the radius of the outer annulus, the radius of the inner annulus, the radius from the axis of rotation to the test sections, and then the hydraulic diameter of the test sections. The first non-dimensional parameter is the rotational Reynolds number. Uh, it correlates the rotation of iris to the rotation of uh, a disc by burn slot. Again, this is the rotation of these test sections as it spins around uh, the drive shaft. We have Honeywell's uh, design point value and then our value calculated from the physical dimensions of iris and then the percentage difference between the two. Our next is the mass flow Reynolds number. Again, this correlates the mass flow of iris versus the mass flow of a disc by burn slot. Again, we have Honeywell's uh, design point value and then our actual value based on the physical dimensions of iris and then the difference between them. We then have the Taylor number, which characterizes the flow through iris and correlates that with the same characteristics of flow through a disc by burn slot. We have, again, Honeywell's design point value and then our actual value uh, based on calculations of the physical dimensions of iris. As you can see, the difference between them is well above our acceptable deviation. This is due to an error uh, in design that was propagated through fabrication of the rig. Uh, we have here a chart uh, stating the impact of the discrepancies uh, to our non-dimensional parameters. We have our uh, rotational Reynolds number, uh, mass flow Reynolds number, and Taylor number. We also have the swirl number, which uh, is used to uh, as a ratio between the tangential and uh, rotational speed of the airflow uh, going through iris. Now, this is, can only be accurately calculated uh, with a full CFD model, and uh, at this time, our CFD model is not uh, at the point where it can give us an accurate value for this number. I will now go over the major rig modifications. The first was a concrete base, uh, weighs approximately 740 pounds. Uh, we installed iris on top of it in order to secure it during testing and to minimize vibrations through the rig. We then placed the electric motor underneath iris. Uh, this gave us a shorter belt, which allowed us to have less belt slippage at high rotation. We also uh, put more weight on the platform by putting this design in and also distributed the downforce from the belt onto the A-frame uh, supports. We also consolidated the heaviest equipment on one platform which makes it easier uh, when we're preparing to test and move this into position. We made a tensure pulley system here which uh, increases tension on the belt and also the con increases the contact angle on the drive pulleys. Uh, using this, we are able to uh, increase the friction force on the drive pulley and allow iris to reach higher speeds of rotation with less belt slippage. We have a, uh, we installed a new seal which, uh, like the old seal, is ablative. However, we're using a stronger rubber material that allows it to last for uh, multiple uh, test runs uh, without needing to be replaced. Uh, we use a white lithium grease in order to lubricate the seal and also to help retain the air mass flow inside the rig. We then uh, installed adjustment bolts on the bottom uh, of our slip ring mount, which we'll talk about later. And uh, this helps uh, us properly align the slip ring with the drive shaft uh, of Iris, uh, allowing the slip ring to function without uh, any damage occurring to it from this alignment. I'll now hand it off to Christian Phillips to go with this presentation.
Thank you, Jackson. Instrumentation is arguably one of the most important aspects of this project. All the physical modifications we made for now, we can't collect accurate pressure data. That being said, one of the primary differences between our instrumentation scheme and the one used by the original C team is our choice of DAT, or data acquisition. The original C team chose to use a measurement computing USB 2305 DAC. One of the benefits of this DAC is it does use a USB interface, so you can use it with virtually any computer. However, because it's third party for the LabVIEW software we're using to display and report the data, there were some interfacing issues. Luckily, we were able to borrow an NI SCC 2305 DAC from the College of Engineering and SNI department. Some of the benefits of this, are, of this DAC are it uses a module system, uh, an example of which can be seen on the screen here, uh, with each module correlating to an individual piece of instrumentation. This DAC allows for 16 modules to be used simultaneously, correlating to 16 pieces of instrumentation. This allows us to add instrumentation in the future, should we need to. Because both the DAC and the LabVIEW software are made by National Instruments, the interfacing has been streamlined and additional functionality has been opened up in the LabVIEW software. It also provides four digital channels which allow us to implement digital instrumentation in the project, something we had difficulty doing with the measurement computing DAC. One of the biggest issues we faced this semester, not only this semester, but this year in general, was with the slip ring. The slip ring is used to pass data from the rotational frame to the stationary frame so we can report it on the computer. When we inherited the slip ring, it had 28 channels, and we did an analysis to determine whether or not all of those would be able to provide accurate data. We determined that 12 of these channels were either intermittent or broken and not usable to transmit data. Because this slip ring wasn't designed for this application, due to friction, it heats up considerably, uh, which degrades the slip ring and reduces its lifespan. Because of this, it's encouraged or suggested that an alternative to the slip ring be pursued. We also inherited four Kool-Aid XTE-190s from the original C team. These were donated by Honeywell uh, last year. These pressure transducers are good up to 25 PSI. Our, from our preliminary CFD models, we're expecting approximately 22 PSI, which puts us within range. These have a burst pressure of 75 PSI, which means these are a good pressure transducer for this application. An additional benefit is they are G compensated, up to approximately 10,000 G. At a radius of 1.3 feet, they're expected to be subjected to approximately 5,400 G. Unfortunately, during testing, two of these Kool-Aids are damaged. Typically, there is a diaphragm located right here on top of the transducer that allows the fresh transducer to collect data. In this current configuration, these two sensors are unable to collect data, so a suitable replacement is required. We believe these two Kool-Aids underwent damage due to burr left in the mounting ports combined with the vibration of the ring. This forced us to research suitable alternatives to the pressure transducers to ensure we can still collect data. And this is what we found. These are TTL level pressure transducers, also made by Honeywell. They're good up to 30 PSIA. They weigh approximately one ounce each. And they're relatively cheap compared to the Kool-Aids, weighing in at $41 as opposed to approximately 1,000. They also provide three output modes, two of which are digital. We intend to continue using the analog output mode, as this is what our LabVIEW co code is set up for. But should the inductive coupling from the motor prove too great, we can switch to the digital signal to reduce the noise. Because these pressure transducers are designed to be used with a PCB, or printed circuit board, uh, we were required to fabricate one in order to use it on this project. And this is what we came up with. These holes here correlate to the four pressure transducers, and these holes here correlate to the wires that are attached to the slip ring. We then took that PCB and mounted it on a collar, as can be seen in this picture, which then gets placed between these two red lines. The first boundary being the annulus, and the second boundary being the first large support disc. Because these pressure transducers aren't threaded like the Kool-Aids, a new method in order to get the pressure da data from the pressure ports down to the pressure transducers is required. Uh, the method we're using is the use of elbows that are threaded and screw into the pressure ports, as can be seen here and then plastic tubing that feeds that down to the pressure transducers located at the shaft. Because we're implementing new hardware, we knew it would be important to conduct an analysis to determine whether this hardware would be able to meet our design point. Unfortunately, due to a lack of data sheet and poor information on these elbows, it was difficult to conduct a proper analysis. The material cited was brass, which has a yield tensile strength of approximately 45,000 PSI. 
So we then used ANSI simulation software to determine what RPM would meet that uh, using the principal stresses. Unfortunately, it meets approximately 45,000 PSI at 2,000 RPM, which means that to use these elbows, it doesn't rule it out, but it requires additional reinforcement. Another piece of instrumentation we added this semester was the use of a total pressure device. These are located at the end of the test sections and allow us to determine the total pressure in the test section. That coupled with the static pressure reading from the pressure transducers allows us to determine the mass flow for each section. This graph was included to show that the force placed on objects in rotation isn't linear, it's actually exponential, and the reinforcement required uh, is needs to scale as such. Some additional piece of pieces of instrumentation we have on this project are a thermocouple. We inherited a Type K thermocouple from the original C team. This is placed at the diffuser right after the blower, so we can determine the temperature of the mass flow as it enters the rig, as this is important in calculating the dimensions parameters. One of the primary pieces of instrumentation that we added this semester was an RPM sensor. The original team suffered from an inability to determine the RPM due to bell slippage between the drive shaft and the motor. This allows us to get an accurate representation of the rotational velocity of iris. Uh, rotational velocity of iris. Uh, it's good up to 250,000 RPM. Our design point is approximately 3,174 RPM, so this is both within bounds. One of the limitations we found with this RPM sensor, as it is optical, in direct sunlight, it has issues to term accurately determining the rotational velocity. We also added a mass flow sensor that's located between the blower and the diffuser at the entrance to the rig. This allows us to determine the mass flow coming from the blower as it enters the rig. This, coupled with our static pressure measurement device, allows the total pressure measurement device allows us to determine the leakage in the system. This mass flow meter is rated for 1,000 cubic feet per minute. Our design point is approximately 800 cubic feet per minute, so this is well within bounds. As we stated earlier, the slip ring has a limited lifespan, so we spent a lot of time this semester trying to determine a possible alternative. Uh, the best solution we came up with was the use of a microcontroller coupled with a telemetry device that would remove the need for the slip ring altogether. The microcontroller we chose was a SAM 3X AD. Uh, we chose this because it has 12 bit ADCs, which is four times the standard resolution of an analog to digital converter. It also provides 12 analog channels, which allows for six pe 12 pieces of instrumentation or six pieces in a differential setup. It's also a 32-bit microprocessor, which allows for the use of floating point map on the chip before it's transmitted. Uh, the best board we found for this chip was the Arduino GUI, as pictured here. Now I can pass it off to Claire Lucas to talk about vibration analysis. Thank you, Christian. I'm going to go over the vibration analysis that we completed on our test rig. Uh, we felt it necessary to understand the natural frequencies at which the rig would encounter uh, prior to testing, so we need to linger on any of those nodes while testing. So first off, we completed a hand calculation of the drive shaft independently, and then for the entire rotating section, which includes the drive shaft, the inner annulus, the small support disc, the two large support discs, and the 12 rotating test sections. So we found the natural frequency of the drive shaft to be 76 hertz, and the natural frequency of the overall rotating session to be 25.4 hertz. We then completed an ANSYS workbench modal analysis on both of those sections to find the natural frequency. Those values were 73.5 and 25.9, which meant that there was a discrepancy for the drive shaft of about 3%, and a discrepancy for the rotating section of about 2%, um, which we then used this information to create a Campbell diagram. A Campbell diagram accounts for the structural influences in the system. So we use the natural frequency of the rotating section of 25.4 hertz in this diagram, which is the linear line seen here. And then we accounted for the structural influences. We did a standard one offset, two for the two supports that hold the front bearing in place, nine for the nine inlet guide vanes, and then finally 12 for the 12 rotating sections. All of the points at which those structural influences interact with the natural frequency of the rotating section were speeds that we wanted to make sure we avoided when running the rig. Should we linger at any of those speeds, we could cause undue harm to our test rig. We then moved on to do a systems vibration analysis. Uh, we used three accelerometers borrowed from the SNI lab on campus, and we placed them on iris itself, the motor, and then the blower. We placed them in the three axes, X, Y, and Z, where the Y axis is the axis parallel to the flow. 
We were able to do a full speed run of iris up to 3200 RPM with no blower, um, and we analyzed that. And the results we then analyzed using a fast Fourier analysis, which accounts for the magnitude at which the vibrations occur. So this is our fast Fourier analysis of iris. The x axis is in red, the y is in green. So the x axis and the y axis yielded almost identical results with the highest amplitude occurring at 116 hertz, and then the second highest occurring at 174 hertz. However, for the z-axis, all of the frequency, the maximum, occurred at 5.27 hertz. Very different magnitude. So we used this fast Fourier analysis to find our node that we believed was at 25.4 hertz, which in fact, um, the accelerometers recorded a node at 29.17 hertz, which is about a 14% difference. This was important for us to know for all of our future testing. I'm now going to go through the testing procedures we completed. Before testing, our first and most important factor is safety. Uh, we started off by creating a safety perimeter, eliminating any additional personnel in the area. We put glass shields in front of all the personnel that are in place during testing. We place a fire extinguisher nearby. We equip every individual with personal protective equipment, which includes a hard hat, ear protection, and an eye protection protection. We have one primary means of failure containment for iris, <coughs> two ballistic protection shields that are placed on each side of iris in the garage doorway. We then moved on to all of our other um, positioning the major components before testing, including iris in the doorway, aligning the blower, placing the computer at the appropriate place, checking all of the internal components, uh, ensuring that both bearings are in working order, going through the structural components, installing the pressure transducers and ensuring that the hosing that Christian highlighted earlier is attached properly, going through and ensuring that the mass flow meter is installed between the inlet and the blower, and then performing a light hand spin and making sure that nothing stands out as being out of place. We double check that the motor is properly mounted to the base. We check the drive belt system and ensure that the belt has been fully tightened. We check the area for fog as to ensure that nothing gets sucked into the blower during testing. We check the sealing systems. There's two major seals within the rig. There's a, uh, the blower to the inlet is ducting tape is applied to it to ensure that it's airtight. And then the seal that Jackson went over between the rotating and non-rotating frame on the rig is double checked to ensure that it has been properly greased before running. We then can begin testing. So we record the barometric pressure and temperature. We double check that everyone is equipped with their personal, equipped, personal protective equipment. We turn on the electricity to the BFD. We turn on the blower at that point. And then we run the motor up to 45 hertz and maintain at that speed for as long as possible. We then slow down, down the BFD to about 0.5 hertz and proceed to stop the rig. At that point, we can turn off the blower and close the air intake. We can turn off the electricity to the BFD Loosen the angular pulley, which is the belt system, and then we are safe to remove all protective equipment. We store all the major components and we report the barometric pressure and temperature for a later analysis. I'll now pass it off to Alan Marlowe to go over data analysis. Thank you, Barb. One of the more important considerations when it comes to our data analysis is actually mass flow. So there's two ways that we're able to measure the mass flow. One is using the mass flow meter that's been highlighted already and the, as well as the total pressure device, which was also been discussed. At, the, max, at uh, the maximum flow rate that we have seen, it has been approximately, three, approximately 300 standard cubic feet per minute. This, these aren't the units that we are working in, so we convert it to those that we were using, and that came out to approximately 0 0.176 kilograms per second. And also we were able to measure the exit mass flow, and that is done using uh, the total pressure devices mounted opposed at the exit of the test sections. And what we've measured based on the uh, dynamic pressure is a mass flow between 0 0.0012 kilograms per second and 0 0.0024 kilograms per second. So if you, if you calculate the, the percent loss in mass flow, it comes out to roughly 98%. And most of that is going out through the, through the seal between the rotating and the non-rotating sections. So now that we have that data, we decided to recalculate the dimensionless parameters. So the values that we came up with were for the Reynolds rotational, was approximately 1.59 times 10 to the 6, with a percent difference of roughly 45%. The 
the testing value of uh, the Reynolds uh, mass flow number was 8.73 times 10 to the fourth, and that was roughly 58% off. And the Taylor number was 5.33 times 10 to the ninth, and that was at about 68%. The testing conditions that we used to calculate these values was uh, an angular velocity of 185 gradients per second and an m dot of, one point, of 0.176 kilometers per second entering the system. So the actual data. What we can see here from this test, which was from uh, 30 to 600 RPM, was a pressure drop. There was no, the blower was not turned on at this point, so we could actually see how the rotation was affecting the, the pressure measurements. So up until about 200 RPM, we can see that the, the diaphragms on the pressure transducers tend to stay about the same. And then it's, it, they begin their decline. So the reason why this is because the way that these sensors are located, or the, the way they're situated, when ice is spinning, a, the, the diaphragm is forced up, or forced outward. And what that results in is a lower pressure measurement as the as the accelerometer, or I'm sorry, as the pressure density is received. So what we what we did from there is we brought IRS up to 600 RPM and then we turned on the blower. So as you can see here, it starts at about 12.1 psi, and then when we turn we turn on the blower at just over 600 RPM, and the pressure in the total uh, for the two total measurements, which are these ones that go up, uh, went up to about 12. 0.4 psi, a little bit higher, and and at that point, as you'll see in the next slide, the seal failed, so we brought ours to a stop as a standard procedure. And the reason why you're seeing this, these uh, not join back up with the static measurements, is because the blower does not immediately stop the flow once you hit the stop button. It takes time for the blower to spin back down, and that's where we can see these total pressure total pressure measurements still decreasing. So if we look at it from the point of the uh, the change in pressure. We can see that it starts out at about the 12.1 psi. As we spin up to 600 RPM, we can see all four pressure transducers drop. And that, again, is due to the rotation. This little bump right here is from when we initially turned on the blower, and that's before we opened up the door on the blower. When we open up the door on the blower, there is a significant increase in the total pressure. And from that, we were able to, from the difference between the two totals and the two statics, we were able to actually measure the dynamic pressure. A few interesting things that we can see is that the RPM increases uh, when, when the flow is increased, and that is due to the leakage in the seal, because the seal begins to actually lift off of the rotating section, and once it, once it does that, there is less contact and less friction, and because there's less friction, the iris is able to spin faster. And that is, you can easily see that from the small increase right about there in the RPM, and that, that was not uh, from a control input, that was simply due to friction. After the seal failed, we brought iris to a stop as a standard procedure. Anytime that something fails, we immediately bring IRS to a stop as, close, as, as fast and as safely as possible. So what we can see from that is the static pressures begin to climb back up to where they were originally before we started the test. Now the difference here in these two static pressures is uh, we predict, or we believe that this is due to the burrs that are still located inside the test sections, possibly causing the pressure to be different. So again, the same test, this is with the for the dynamic pressure measurements. So dynamic pressure is the difference between the total pressure and the static pressure. And what we're able to see is starting at zero and then moving up to the full rotation where we turn on the blower, which you can easily see here, we have the uh, dynamic pressure, which, rate, which went up to about uh, 0.35 PSI. And we able, were able to calculate the mass flow through all 12 test sections at that point based on the dynamic pressure. And that came out to a value of 0.0012 kilograms per second for this specific test. The velocity coming out of the test section as calculated based on the dynamic pressure was approximately 0.83 meters per second. So the difference between the total pressure and the static pressure for this specific test was approximately 2.87%. So then we decided that we would go for, we would try to shoot for an 1800 RPM test. As you can see behind me, we didn't actually make it there. The, we had a failure at just under 1600 RPM, and as a standard protocol, with the failure, we, did, we brought it back down, we brought ours back down to a stop. So, you can easily see from this graph, and the one I'll show in a few slides, that as the pressure increased, there's a definite drop, or I'm sorry, as the RPM increased, there's a definite drop in pressure. Looking at the dynamic pressure of the same data, we can still see it, it's not as pronounced, but uh, we ended up correcting for the failure. By correcting for the failure, what, what I'm saying is that we went through the, we went through the data, we found the, the data point right before the failure occurred and removed all data afterwards so we can look at the good data um, on its own. 
So for this test, uh, we calculated a mass flow of 0 0.0013 kilograms per second and a velocity of 0 0.93 meters per second exiting, exiting the test sections. So this is the same data from this. Uh, this is from the same test, the same test, but it's now corrected uh, to, to remove for the failure of the total of the total pressure bus. So we can see easily here as the RPM increased, the pressure in all the transducers decreased. And what we're and we can also see a beginning of the total uh, the the total pressure separating from the static pressure. It happens across all of the data, but it's very much it's a lot more pronounced near the end of, of that test. So the dynamic pressure for this, although it is noisy, the reason for that is the scale. The scale between these, uh, from the bottom of the graph to the top, is only 0.4 psi. So it's incredibly small, and we're seeing, and we're able to see all the fluctuations in the data. So what we see from here is that the mass flow, the maximum calculated mass flow through the test sections was 0 0.0007 kilograms per second, and that came out to a velocity of approximately 0.47 meters per second. The dynamic pressure increase was, point three, was between 0.12% uh, and 0.36% for the test sections. And as we, as we can see from this, the, as the RPM increased, the flow actually uh, decreased through the test sections. So at this point, I'd like to pass it off to Logan for the CFD. Thank you, Alan. Today I'll be discussing the use of computational fluid dynamics and how it relates to this project. We use computational fluid dynamics in order to compare all test results received when testing iris with a theoretical model on the computer. This is done in order to troubleshoot any anomalies that may occur during testing that we cannot physically see. This could include any vibrations that may occur during testing that we are aware of, as well as any of the change in mass or loss. We also, in order to make sure the CFD is as accurate as possible, we confirm these values using hand calculations to ensure this model is accurate before confirming with testing. As Jackson said earlier, the CFD model is used to calculate the swirl value, which is to be 0.5, as well as the velocity value entered in the test sections for the tailor number. Now in order to do CFD, we took the model and split it into three different sections. The first section being the inlet, which runs from the entrance of iris to the end of the inlet guide veins. We then went to, into the annulus, which represents the difference between the non-rotating outer wall and the rotating inner wall, and then finally the test sections, which are all 12 or rotating. This is done in order to gain a better understanding of the airflow through each area, as the inlet deals specifically with the airflow through the inlet guide veins and how that adjusts the flow before moving into the annulus. The annulus deals specifically with the swirling flow and how the friction between the airflow and the wall of iris adjusts for the swirl factor. And finally, the test sections and how that changes the airflow as we assume a smooth wall. Finally, in order to do this, we cannot move straight into a three-dimensional system as any errors in the model would not be able to be caught without moving in first to a two-dimensional system. We then move into a three-dimensional half-plane system with a line of symmetry down the center. And then finally, we move into a three-dimensional static system and, and finish it off with a three-dimensional rotational system. Starting off with a three-dimensional uh, or two-dimensional system, we did a turbulent flow. In order to do this, we took a Reynolds number of the entrance of the test section's base entrance to the system, based off the design point of 0.464 kilograms per second. This rep uh, gave us a value of the Reynolds number to be approximately 395,000, which means that all airflow entering iris is considered fully turbulent. This means that in this 2D model with a change in area. Uh, based on the 2D model, the air flow entering iris for this model is approximately 1.5 kilograms per second. Looking at the uh, airflow, the lines represent the uh, velocity flow field through iris, and the colors represent the static pressure running through iris. This pressure is considered gauge pressure and is not absolute. It should be noted that between the entrance of the iris and the entrance to the test sections, this pressure remains approximately constant. This is to be expected as during the uh, fabrication and design of IRIS, the previous team C anticipated this and wanted to remain the pressure to be as constant as possible all the way up to the test sections. However, there is a drop in pressure between inside the annulus and especially as we enter the test sections. This is to be expected as there is a significant change in the cross-sectional area in this area. And in order to uh, have a constant mass flow through the system, the velocity must increase to compensate. And with the use of the Bernoulli's, Bernoulli's equation, in order for the velocity to increase, the static pressure must drop to compensate. 
We then confirm these values with the hand calculations, starting with the exact same inlet pressure of 83,726.7 pascals, which was assumed to be the approximate uh, air pressure here in Prescott. We then move from the inlet to the diffuser, and then through the feed depth into the test sections. It should be noted that the hand calculations do differ slightly from the CFD model due to the fact that CFD takes into account the frictional value between the airflow and the walls of iris, while the hand calculations assume a frictionless environment. With these small uh, deviations, we determine the 2D turbulent model to be uh, useful in evaluating to a uh, test data, specifically the test data taken at 1600 revolutions per minute. It should be noted, however, that looking at the, between the test data inlet and the test data at the 2D turbulent, that the pressure is different. In order to compensate for this, another 2D model with time needs to be run in order to compensate for the difference in pressure. However, looking between the uh, inlet and the test sections, both between the 2D turbulent model as well as the test sections, there is a significant drop in the pressure in the test sections in both models. However, you can notice that the turbulent model in, uh, from CFD has a lot smaller change in the uh, static pressure uh, than the test data. This is due to the fact that the uh, iris is rotating during the test data, which increases and parts a larger velocity on the airflow, thereby reducing the static pressure further. We then moved into a three-dimensional half-plane system. However, this three-dimensional half-plane system was never able to converge. This is due to the fact that the, uh, the air velocity is running through iris is, um, it being a perfect circle, is not running properly. These values here with the line of continuity show where iris is, the model is finding turbulence in the system. However, this line has to drop below 1 times 10 to negative 3 for the system to be considered fully converged and a steady state solution to be found. This means that the computational fluid dynamics system cannot find a steady state and is unbelieved that the system is in turbulent and in transient flow. This is due to the fact that when it runs a three-dimensional half-plane system, there's a line of symmetry down the middle of the system and any airflow entering that area at an angle has a perfect uh, mirror on the other side in an equal and opposite direction. This means that in, with respect to the annulus, any airflow entering iris from the uh, inlet has an equal and opposite, causing the, uh, the annulus to have airflow running in two different directions. This causes the system to never be able to find a perfect steady state solution, resulting in an inability to converge. This means that in order to continue to get proper data, we moved into a three-dimensional model. The current three-dimensional model is not completed and is still currently running on the CFD computer. However, do plan on the non-rotational model in order to gain static baseline use and the rotational model, as well as to see the effects of the inlet guide veins and how that pertains to the swirl value prior to entering the annulus. From there, we move, we'll move into the rotational model, which allows us to observe the rotational effects of the annulus and test sections and how that affects the swirl value through the system. We can then also calculate the swirl number and the velocity values to confirm whether or not iris is meeting, meeting two of its dimensionless parameters, particularly the swirl number and the tailor number. From there, we can also do pressure verification and take the pressure out of the, uh, in the, the test sections and confirm these with test data from iris. I now pass it off to Claire Lucas, who will be going over labor hours. Thank you, Libby. I'm going to go over the labor hours we completed this semester. In green is our accounted for hours, and in blue is our predicted hours. Um, as you can tell, we're a little under for the semester. I mean, through with that, to spending less time on design work and more time on the hardware itself, implementation of new sensors, and testing. The budget we were allotted for this semester, we were given $5,500, and we spent about $3,500 of those dollars, which leaves us with about $2,000 remaining in our budget. Conclusion and recommendations. In conclusion, um, we determined that the mass flow rate currently being provided by the blower is 0.176 kilograms per second, which does not meet our testing requirements. We also determined that the CO leakage rate of 98.6% is too great and does not meet our testing requirements. Um, we also uh, demonstrated that there is a clear relationship between rotation and pressure. Uh, when rotation is in place, it decreases the amount of pressure through the system. We also determined that more time and more analysis is needed in order to complete the objective of this project. 
Some of the recommendations for a future team include um, fully implementing the Arduino microcontroller that Christian went over earlier. It's been purchased, however, it has not been implemented into the instrumentation system. Once that's implement, implemented, uh, telemetry can be done and the slip ring will be fully eliminated from the system. Configuring the mass flow meter needs to be completed. Um, we are able to currently read the mass flow meter live. However, we, we have not configured that and integrated it completely into the instrumentation system. So it needs to get com configured with the DAC. The sealing method needs to be completely redesigned. Um, the mass flow loss needs to be much less than what we're currently getting. However, that's extremely challenging as it is a seal between a rotating and non-rotating section. Uh, the tolerance for the outer annulus also makes it challenging to find a method to seal it. The mass flow system needs to be replaced. Uh, the blower does not provide enough mass flow to get to the 0.464 kilograms per second that are needed to complete this project. The CFD model in 3D needs to be fully completed. Uh, once it is complete, it can be actually used to compare against all of the results we're getting from test data. It's important that we be able to verify our results. And then the last recommendation we have is to add or have the ability to take pressure measurements at other locations other than the test sections. We currently only have the ability to measure pressure at the exit of the test section and in the middle of the test section. There are a lot of other pressure measurements that would be very useful for the analysis for this project. These are our citations. And before I open the floor for questions, we have a demonstration at 11.45 uh, down at the back of the propulsion lab. Please feel free to come by. Now, is there any questions? Thank you. 
configuration, uh, recognizing that on the short term, vibrate it out, but on the long term, those vibrations last over a period of time and eventually you'll vibration, you know, etc. So, uh, two things here, and I'm going to be honest about one of them. Uh, we had a previous teammate here. Yeah. Well, we're going to be honest with both. But one of them is a little bit, you know, I'm putting myself in the line of fire for this one. Uh, we had previous, there was another teammate on the team who was very good with construction work and concrete. Um, so I am not sure all the analysis that he completed. I know he did do some analysis on the longevity of our concrete slab and where the holes should be and all of those things. But I personally don't know those, and I don't think anyone on the team does. As you used an outside person then to help with that foundation. No, he is a contractor by night. Uh, he, that, his father owns a contracting business in Phoenix, and so he used tools and knowledge from that uh, to do that. As for the vibration analysis, uh, I did a little bit of vibration analysis on whether the concrete would survive all of the operations, and I found that it was more than sturdy enough to do what we were expecting. Okay, so for personal experience, make sure you understand what goes into that foundation because at some point it affects what happens to you. Um, the um, other thing is uh, that belt, uh, and this is also a safety question, the way you change the tension on that belt, uh, did you evaluate the effect that we have on the strength of that belt over the long term and or whether it's going to uh, break, but then also elongate and then change your, your rotational energy at some point? Um, I don't think we did a in-depth analysis of the, the strength of the belt. Uh, we did uh, take into account uh, the actual, like when we purchased the belt, we made sure that it was uh, designed to withstand the tension uh, that we were planning to place it under. And uh, the drive belt was uh, designed for uh, large motor applications, so uh, it, it was designed to handle uh, what we believe to be the same uh, tension that we'd be placing on this belt. Would you put some sort of frictional force on that, right? Uh, yes. So. What effects did you expect to see with that friction? Uh, we, we designed the, the, the potential pulley system to be um, as uh, loose, uh, or not loose, but uh, free flowing as possible. So uh, when the belt turns, um, although it's uh, placing a force on the belt, uh, the tension pulleys uh, actually uh, create a very minimal amount of uh, friction force on the belt itself. Okay, uh, the um, other comment, it really didn't have any effect because you ended up using new pressure transmitters, but what consideration did you make utilizing the old pressure transmitters uh, for, for the previous one? And uh, did you consider the tau frequency? Or, I, I see you used other instrumentation as you before. Did you look at the calibration frequency on, on any of the so we were left the four original coolant pressure transducers by the last team. Uh, we had one calibration data sheet that came with them. So we got together with our experimental aero professor, because he has a calibration device, and then we recalibrated those pressure transducers. But as far as looking at the calibration sheets, they didn't come with the pressure transducers themselves. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, you sure did. <laughs> so, sometimes, sometimes you're using equipment from before, and that's fine. It's really restricted on cost and stuff. But you don't know whether, in fact, that device is going to be an accurate result if you don't know really what the calibration frequency is. Sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's five years. You know? The calibration frequency on the one data sheet we had said it needed to be updated last July, so before we started the project. Okay. Um, the, the, while you did talk a little bit about failure containment, uh, could have had a little bit more of a slight perhaps and hazard analysis and other things that you took precautions on. Uh, just a comment. Um, I know that 
talk a little bit about some of the safety precautions you do today, but uh, really be nice to see a little bit more of that as you can uh, The other thing, uh, I guess, on the question on budget, um, we had quite a differential in budget. Um, it's always, you always look good when you save budget, but having a good, accurate forecast is also pretty important, particularly if you're in a big company that has a lot of projects going on. Can you comment on why you underspent your budget at all? Um, so we were uh, given an allotted amount. We do not uh, forecast our own spending. Um, secondly, uh, the budget is, the original team used their budget fully. Um, because we did less fabrication when it came to the rig itself, um, we didn't have to outsource as much. They had to outsource and have some discs, water jet cut, a lot of really expensive components. Uh, we didn't have to do that. We, our biggest purchase was the mass flow meter, which was almost two grand. Uh, the remaining budget, we are hoping to actually order a pallet jack so that we can move the uh, entire rig more freely. Currently, it requires a forklift, and that's uh, complicated and challenging to always have a forklift person on hand. So forecasting was it wasn't necessarily part of the question. No, it was not. <laughs> Thank you, that's uh, all the questions I have. Um, just want to say nice job. Um, we really only have one question, and maybe you touched on this and I just missed it. But, uh, on slide 60, we were discussing the parameters just with the conditions. Um, I was just curious why you saw such a difference between the verified and tested values. So the, the tested values are what we've been able to experimentally um, test with, which is the, the design speed is 3,176 RPM. The max that we have gotten to is uh, 1,595. And we are also not able to flow all the mass flow through the system that we need. So it's it's basically comparing, it's almost comparing apples to oranges. Okay. Uh, if they, if they, uh, fix the speed and the seal issue, sealing leakage issue, then they'll pick up the mass flow and they'll have a higher rotation so they just bring them closer to design. Okay. That was a lot of Good job, guys. Just while you have the slide up, I think, you know, something that just caught my eye. So you've got some uh, columns is verified and that column is testing. Usually you test to verify. So it's a word choice. Verify comes at the very end. Test comes at the middle. So actually, I, I get what you're trying to, to say with that problem, but I get it. Yeah, actually, it should be design value, yeah. test value, difference. Yes, yeah, OK. Um, so I, I've got a couple of comments kind of more on presentation style than the, the technical side. So um, slide right before this one is when you told me that you have a 98% mass flow loss through the seal. And you, know, you said it very matter of factually, you know, unemotional, which, which is good. <laughs> Here's our result, that's what it is. And then you moved on. You never told me if that was good or bad. Obviously it's not good, but you just said, here's a number. And then 30 slides later, during the conclusions, you said, oh, that was bad. So. So when you're presenting a result, whether it's good or bad, you know, as an engineer, you need to immediately state the result and the impact. You need to tie the two together. And then at the end, you come up with a recommendation, either how to fix it, how to go back, how to redesign, how to, how to do all that. So, you know, it's, I, I don't think you're trying to, to hide anything or just like jump over it, but, you know, you, a number always has to have an interpretation of it. So, um, so then just like another comment, like in the next couple of slides, we've got a bunch of plots up there which all show good data. You guys did a, you did a great job of talking us through it. Um, but because there's a lot of data on there, something that I would recommend, you know, you talk about, oh, here's when the, the, um, the seal failed, here's when you know, the, the pressure failed. So if you can kind of somehow mark that on the plot so that as soon as I look at it, you know, within about five seconds, I can go, oh, that's what happened. 
you know, the plot needs to stand on its own and not have you know, two minutes of explanation, which was great explanation, but you know that you can get someone distracted and you know maybe they walk away with a different conclusion from the data that we intend. So make the, the plot a little more standalone. Um, you guys did a great job on the, the safety analysis. Um, one thing though that I would recommend real world, especially when you're doing testing, uh, you have your safety planning, you have your, you know, we're gonna have all this equipment standby, someone on the fire extinguisher, we're gonna have you know these this containment device around it. Something else that we usually do since you guys are recording data, you know, you can identify certain parameters and values for those that would indicate something's going wrong and you stop the test before you have the failure. A lot of your responses would to a failure that already happened instead of preemptive failure. I know that you know, maybe it wasn't ideal for this kind of test, but if you can prevent the failure, it saves the company money. You know, it's easier to redesign before you break something than to break it and then redesign. So just we'll consider that in the future. But you guys did a great job. So awesome. Thank you. He has done a great job on what's obviously a very complex uh, fluid dynamic and experimental uh, problem. Uh, just two questions. One is what do you think can be done about the problem of uh, the pressure drop with uh, rotational speed? So one of the things that can be done is if we once we measure exactly what that pressure drop is or how that adjusts as we increase in the velocity. We can use that and put that into our data analysis and actually have that the values adjusted so we can see what that's And my other one might, might be more of a Honeywell question, but uh, just curious, being an engine guy, what, what real life engine design issue are you trying to get insight to? Or? Well, what we're trying to do here is, is in the real uh, air engine, in the turbine section where we the blades with cooling air, discrete blade slots, uh, we have a difficulty, uh, especially for small engines like in our class, to get a pressure sensor in there with, in that rotating slot and measure the pressure that's feeding the blade. And that's important to know because that sort of validates our, our secondary flow models and our cooling flow models to, uh, to verify the, the cooling flow that we are considering for life and et cetera, and also, as well as for performance assessment. So the, 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 this uh, task is to, to assess the feasibility of these type of pressure transducers in that location to give reliable pressure measurements under rotation and the cooling flow. So that's the application. Thank you, great job. Any questions from the crowd? <clears throat> Just a comment, your uh, budget discrepancy would go away when you redesign your uh, seal. Yes. I was wondering whether we should keep that actually until they do it. <laughs> Yeah.